Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. I'm also the CEO and founder of Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we provide HR to companies with 49 or fewer people. Our guest today is the Honorable Dr. Lynn Robinson, Mayor of Bellevue, Washington. Lynn, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Um, first, hopefully, it's a softball question. What do you do for fun, hobby, stuff like that? Well, less and less because the job's taking more and more of my time. But I love to be creative. So anything creative, I enjoy doing painting, knitting, crocheting, drawing. Um, I love walks. I love nature. And I love boating. So what, is, what does creative mean to you? I think being creative means different things to different people. Like for me, like I don't consider this podcast being creative, but a lot of people tell me it's being creative, right? So what does like, creative mean to you? Yeah, I think it's more art. Okay. And have you done any paintings recently? Yes, I have. Do you have a favorite painter? Oh, I have a lot of favorite painters. I think A.E. Church. Okay. Is one of my favorites. Um, when I say overseas, I actually go to all the art museums over in Europe, like the Louvre, the Rice Museum. Yeah. And uh, Bellevue actually has a pretty vibrant art scene too, correct? I mean. We have a blossoming art scene. Uh, we have a Bell Red Arts District that is just growing right now. We have a wonderful gallery that's called One Re Rue Gallery on Bell Red Road. Um, we have a Studio 33, which is a little theater. Um, we're, the city's actually going to be building um, housing with affordable artist lofts in it. And on the ground floor will be... Um, gallery space for the artist. To it's almost like a startup incubator for artists almost. Okay, exactly. And so how does like an artist apply for that? I don't know yet. Um, we haven't finished the building. We okay. haven't started the building. Okay. okay. But I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, opportunities, but you can always email me if you're interested, lrobinson at bellevuewa.gov. And does Bellevue, like Seattle has an art museum? Is there like a Bellevue art museum? Is this a setup? No. Okay. <laughs> Yes, we've had a Bellevue Art Museum okay. for a long time, but it just went into receivership what, what does last that mean? month. Um, it's not uh, bankruptcy, but it means that they don't feel like they have enough money to make it through the rest of their year. Okay. And so they're going to stop while they still have money. Somebody comes in and kind of takes over, and it's a wonderful woman named Shelly Crocker who is the receiver. She's going to take about a year and a half to really examine what does the community want in an arts museum in Bellevue. It's a beautiful, architecturally significant building in a perfect location. It has every opportunity to succeed. We just need to find out what is interesting to people and what will draw them in. Okay. Okay. Um, so next, from your point of view, what is the purpose of a mayor? Is a mayor supposed to like protect the citizens, supposed to like being, being like out of, out of tax revenue, like from your point of view, what's the point of a mayor? Well, may, there's two kinds of mayors. I don't know if you know that. So there's a strong mayor, and I hate to say it, it's called a weak mayor. I'm a weak mayor. Um, so that we have a council city manager form of government. So the city manager is in charge of hiring and managing all the staff and everything that has to do with managing the city, they do. The council is policy. And the one hire that we do is the city manager. And so I'm elected amongst my peers, the council, and it's a two-year term. I'm on my third two-year term. And my role is to represent the council. So when I speak, which I'm speaking today, I'm speaking for the council. So I'm not going to come off with an opinion that is solely mine and not the council if it's a policy that we voted on. And uh, I also help create the agenda. I also liaise with the uh, council and and the city manager. It, so, it, but it's like the hiring the city manager. That's a pretty pivotal role, I would think. Yes. For your hire. Yes. I it's mean, huge. Um, and so, how do you do this? How do you balance like talking about your personal beliefs versus city council beliefs? Are you just? Different? I I will qualify it. Okay. I will always qualify it, but. I will say that um, I think also the role of the mayor is to be present in the community so that the, the uh, community sees representation and, under, and knows that we are out there with them, not just living in a little castle in isolation. And so 
all the council members and the mayor get out and attend just a ton of events. And that's why I am so busy is I'm always going to events. So basically you're the public face for the city, correct? Exactly. Um, and you have a goal, like, I don't know, each month to hit like 10 public speaking places or, or you just, are you just like something comes up, you'll go to it, someone recommends it to you or. Oh, I get invited. So I, oh, yeah, I go to do. every single thing that I can. Okay. Um, I'm not going to seek it out. Usually I don't seek it out on my own. The other job that I have is creating good relationships regionally. Mm -hmm. So it's up to me to, you know, know the other mayors um, and have a good working relationship with them. So how do you do that? Like to me, it has to be a balance between like being collaborative and competitive with other, other cities, right? How does that work? <laughs> like suppose I'll make this up. A company says we're going to bring 10,000 jobs to one of these cities. Do you all cooperate? They split the 10,000 jobs up or do you like, Come to Bellevue, we have a tax cut, or how's that even work? <laughs> that's not really my role. That's really economic development's role. Okay. And yeah, absolutely. They're going for everything they can. And if Bellevue gets it, then I will be really nice about it. And <laughs> if they don't get it, then I'll try to figure out why we didn't. Okay. Um, what's, what's a sister city? This one's always one all my life. What's, is, uh, I mean, is there like an economic benefit of both cities or just like a public relations? No, act? it's a, it's a big deal. It, it was a okay. uh, sister city association was formed after world war two. So it's an older organization and it was originally intended to teach our children about other countries and about the people in other countries. So there would be less likelihood that they would go to war in the okay. future. So, um, I, I would imagine that coming off of World War II, there was a lot of fear and, and dislike of the countries we had just fought, our enemies at that time. So this was an effort to repair those relationships with the children. So it's an exchange program, and they send high school students over to another country and vice versa. It's uh, We... Um, go visit their country and they visit our country with delegations. Um, so Bellevue has, gosh, five, I think, sister cities. And uh, we have uh, Walian in Taiwan. We have Yao in Japan. I have been to Yao. And, you know, we have like a Yao Japanese garden in our botanical gardens. And it's beautiful. And they have contributed ancient statuary to our garden. So that's lovely. Um, the Wallian uh, Sister City have provided three beautiful marble statues that are in our city hall plaza. Um, we have Clad Cladzo or something. I don't know what it's called. Um, I, there's three more that I have never been to. And is it to say these cities like stay kind of, like, kind of permanent? Like they don't change every year, right? They pretty much stay the same. Oh no, they've been sister cities for, since I think the beginning of okay. Bellevue. But here's the challenge. It's run by volunteers. I did not know that. And when it was first established, there were a lot of parents who wanted exchange students in their homes and they wanted their ch children to go to exchange. Well, those people have all aged out and we haven't had a huge interest. So there's very few people volunteering this right now. Okay. But when you do have a robust program, it is so gratifying. It is so enriching. I just last night went and met the um, Prime Minister of New Zealand. And uh, no, excuse me, it wasn't the Prime Minister. That was last year. It was the Ambassador of New Zealand. And um, we met the uh, two consul generals, one honorary and one official. And uh, the room was just full of New Zealanders who live in this area. And it's a real great connection for them to have that and so they're all their sister cities with uh, I guess Christchurch is sister cities with Seattle. Okay. And so that was a really big deal moment for all. Sounds like a lot of fun part. It sounds like a fun part of your job. It, that's fun, absolutely. Um, so, um, for the formal government, right? So do you find you find find yourself like doing doing more influencing over the city council, like trying to influence them to do what you want to do, or is, or is this more like no. the city council like? Is all one big group, you're all on the same page, you just go from there? No, neither. Okay. I mean, I have my definite opinions on things, but I'm only allowed to speak with two others. Otherwise, it's a considered a meeting, okay. a running meeting. 
So I get to speak with two other council members about issues outside of our meetings. But um, no, I never try to influence the vote. Okay. But I do try to make sure that everybody has all the education on the issue that they need to make a good decision. We have a very diverse council. Um, you know, even people I consider my friends don't always vote with me. And so I never know what the outcome's going to be. Okay. And uh, I can tell in the in the conversation by the questions being asked where it's heading sometimes. But um, I do not try to influence the vote. And you, you took over as mayor in 2020? Yeah. Right in the middle of COVID? How, how right was before that? Before right before COVID. COVID? How was that? Tough. Tough, I can imagine. Yeah. Very tough. I mean, um, fortunately, I come from a healthcare background. And I think that that was a great guidance for me during that time. I, I knew that we had to react immediately. There were a lot of cities who went into a holding pattern. And um, I just kind of treated it. It was very similar to me as the AIDS crisis when that first came out because nobody knew how it was transmitted. Nobody knew um, what the future was going to be. They just knew it was very deadly. And so uh, the, everybody went into, you know, big um, protocol for making sure they, they didn't catch it. Um, and I was working in the hospital at that time. So I went through all that. But you don't just stop doing things. You just, you adapt. And there were so many emerging needs. When the schools closed down, people were, didn't, no longer had childcare. And for the families that relied on free and reduced lunch and breakfast, that was gone. And then the people who were in the healthcare industry, they were having to work double shifts. So there was this huge uh, have, have nots moment. Our tech companies were doing great. Our, our retail companies were not, our businesses were not doing great. Um, the one thing that Bellevue did um, preemptively that was just luck is we created online permitting right before COVID hit. So we did a ton of permitting during that time when everybody was working from home. So a lot of governments couldn't do anything. We could do that. So that was bringing in revenue. Okay, nice. Yeah. Um, not calling this plastic table, that never happens again. But if it did, any lessons learned you can pass on? Well, I think it took us way too long to recognize that it was an aerosol. You know, we didn't know if it was a droplet, whether it was a gas. It was kind of evident to me that it was not a gas, otherwise everybody would have had it. And it was evident it wasn't just a droplet, otherwise people in the back of the room wouldn't have gotten it. So it seemed like a classic aerosol. And so uh, that's how I treated it from the beginning. So making, so the outdoor dining, you know, encouraging that, um, making sure all the windows and doors were open, that there was fresh air circulation everywhere you went. And, um, you know, masking, obviously, but the plastic shields, that doesn't do anything. Yeah. I agree with you on that one. Yeah. Well, if it was a droplet, they would. Yeah. Yeah. So what's something that since you've been mayor that you're, you're, you're proud that Bellevue has done, like something Bellevue or yourself has accomplished since you've taken over as mayor? Thank you. That's a nice question. Um, I think I'm really proud of our affordable housing program. We put that in, in 2017. I was not mayor until 2020, so we didn't start implementing anything until 2020. And then we just went crazy and we got as many of the recommendations from the plan in as possible. And we're still uh, implementing them because it takes land use codes and, and everything. And this is the year of the comprehensive plan. So we're uh, putting into all of that. But it really, creates far more opportunity for developers to create affordable housing. And so you can redevelop a church property. You can, we reduce parking limits. I don't know how deep you want me to get into this. Probably not very as deep as you want to. Well, so anyway, it, you can email me if you want more information, <laughs> but I'm really proud of that because we've doubled the amount of affordable housing stock since we implemented that. So that's a good thing. Um, I'm very proud of what we did during COVID with our human services. We put a ton of money into human services and we have a million dollar council contingency that we all voted to dump into human services. And we've done a lot of rental assistance 
So as our city has experienced tremendous growth over the last 10 years, we've also done a lot of work to try to retain our communities. So what is affordable housing? Is that based on a certain amount of income a person may or might have or economic status or how is that determined? Okay, so the average home price is $1.3 million in Bellevue and the area median income, which is going to be different because Bellevue is more expensive than the other cities. But area median income is about... Um, It's a little, I think it's a little over, oh shoot, I don't know. It's like between 88 and and $100,000 a year for a family of four. Okay. And so 80% of that and below is called affordable. Okay. And if you're paying more than 30% of your income towards rent every month, that's considered being cost burdened. Okay. So people in that situation, and there's many wealthy people who pay more than they should uh, for rent, but- people who don't have that choice, they are, it's hard for them to save. It's hard for them to, you know, tolerate any downturns in their lives. Yeah. They're on the edge. Obviously this isn't your lane, but always, always, it's like kind of me, like mind boggling it were, let's suppose someone goes to a bank and a loan for a mortgage, right? And they'll say like, you know, and the mortgage would be like, we'll say $2,000 a month. And the bank will say no for whatever reason. But then you got to go, buy a place of rent for 3000 you right? Oh, I never thought about it. You, you know, like, you know, I can't afford this mortgage. What makes you think I can afford this rent? Oh, but, my goodness. But then I have to get roommates and stuff like that, you know? That doesn't make any sense to me. Well, what, what makes sense to me is the bank doesn't have to jettison your apartment when you can't pay for it anymore. That's true, yeah. But I never thought about it that way. That's very insightful. Yeah, thank you. Um, so what's something that you're working on that you really want to accomplish but just haven't been able to do it yet for whatever reason? as far as being in the city of Bellevue, some kind of master plan you have or something that's going on, like you just haven't been able to do it yet, whatever reason. I'm currently working on a affordable housing strategy for Wilburton, which is a neighborhood that we're, we are redeveloping. And there's a camp that wants to do mandatory inclusionary housing where you mandate a developer put in affordable housing. And I want to put in strong incentives so that they want to put it in. And I feel like the reward program will work better. We'll end up with better architecture and we'll, we'll end up with, um, I, I just have watched cities that mandate it and the developer just cuts off all the pretty part of the building. And so it's just a basic building and yeah, they get the affordable housing in there, but I want to, you know, I want the whole thing. I want yeah. the, the architecture and the community feel. I want the trees um, and I want affordable housing and I want them to put it in how they want to. If they want to put it in on the ground floor, I'm fine with that. They want to do um, micro units in the corners, you know, of course I want windows, but in odd spaces, uh -huh. as long as it fits the definition of a micro unit, I'm fine with that. And they can make it affordable because we have a multifamily property tax exemption for micro units. So giving the developer a little more control over how they create the affordable housing, but I still need that affordable housing. So I will give you 3.1 FAR to start with. No developer wants that. You want more then you have to put in affordable housing or you have to pay a fee in lieu that's going to be pretty hefty because I don't want just a bunch of fee and lose. So how do you deal with this? And maybe you don't have to deal with this, but it's like a lot of towns, the, the people will say, we want to take care of people, affordable housing. And then when a plan comes out, we're going to build this neighborhood. They're like, oh, but not here, right? Oh, how do you, that's- How do you deal with that? So Wilburton, um, you know, Wilburton is auto row in Bellevue 116th, all the way up through Home Depot. But we're not, I'm not talking about the, the, the single family neighborhoods. Um, that's a different story. So the state made that decision for us. The state mandated that we have to allow duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, maybe even sixplexes, and attached dwelling units and detached dwelling units in all our single family neighborhoods. The thing that's frustrating to me is it's not equitable because some of the wealthier neighborhoods have covenants and the state law does not surpass neighborhood covenants. So the neighborhoods that don't have covenants, which are lower income neighborhoods, 
they're going to get all the density, but the higher end neighborhoods that have covenants are, will not have to do that. Okay. And how much does Seattle and Bellevue compete with, with, with each other for either business or whatever? I don't think we compete at all. Okay. I mean, uh, Bellevue needs Seattle to do well. Okay. Seattle is the star of the region. Yeah, okay. And Seattle does well, everyone else should do well. Yeah. And they're Ursa major, we're Ursa minor. Okay. <laughs> um, so how does this work? I hope I answered the question right. Obviously, Seattle has a lot of, you know, homelessness, you know, just stuff going on. And it doesn't seem like Bellevue has those problems, right? Is this because, like, Bellevue's policy is, you know, different? Or is it like, like, like whenever someone comes to visit, I had my niece and uh, my nephew and his wife come visit, like, a couple months ago. To me, Seattle, like, their Uncle Jason, how are you living here? Like, all this stuff's going on. We're to Bellevue. First thing they said, it smells like money over here. So oh. it's nice and fresh over here, right? And it's like only 20 miles away. We have, just to clarify, we have a lot of low-income families in Bellevue in affordable housing. And in um, and we do a lot of rent assistance because their kids are in our schools. And we want as many kids in our excellent public mm -hmm. schools as we can get just to make better. They're our future, right? But um, to answer your question, I'm going to say this without judgment. There's a lot of difference between is between how Bellevue and Seattle have handled uh, homelessness. And I will say that every city has a homelessness problem, whether you see it or not, whether you know it or not. And um, Seattle is a huge city. They're much, much bigger than Bellevue. So any problem in Bellevue is going to be far more manageable than a problem in Seattle. But Seattle, in an abundance of compassion makes it legal to camp outside and Bellevue does not. And we have a law that says as long as we have room in the shelter, you can't camp outside. And we've never arrested anyone for camping outside. It's really an access point. So it's kind of like one of these little um, <clears throat> subtleties about policy is that on paper it's, Oh, you're, you're making homelessness illegal. And well, it is, but that's not how it's, it, it's enacted in reality. It's an access point for us to come out and say, hey, you're not allowed to camp here, but we do have a shelter. We will help you take all your things, put you in the back of the car, drive you over there and take all your things with you, which is a real gift to some people who have two shopping carts full of belongings um, and get you all the services that you need to ultimately get you into stable housing. And we have um, homeless outreach coordinators that are sent out to talk to people. It takes about 13 points of contact for somebody to agree to a change. And we go out 13 times. We go out 14, 15 times and say, are you sure? And if they re keep refusing, then we say, we well, have to move. So that 13 number is interesting because I could we make this up. But I'm pretty sure I heard somewhere like if you're just trying to sell something to someone, it takes 13 points of contact also. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, I never heard that. Yes. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a hard number. Yeah. I mean, cause a lot of people, they get comfortable with their living, right? I mean, they're getting well, they're independent. Yeah. No one's telling them what to do, you know? And when you go into a shelter, even though it's a no barrier shelter, you can't break the law. Yeah. And there are certain things you just can't do. And I think you have to be a team player. I mean, that's one of the hardest things in society is to be a team player. There's a lot of people I know who struggle with that. And so somebody who's in a crisis of sorts is going to struggle even more than that. So it's probably not top on their list. Now, if you have somebody who's just yesterday lost their housing, they're going to jump at the opportunity to get into housing any way, shape or form. And so that's a very different situation. So there's a lot of different scenarios. A lot of nuances and like, different things going on. Each person is different. Each situation yeah. is different. Absolutely. Yeah. And different ages, right? You handle things differently at different ages. But I'll tell you, we do have a, a men's homeless shelter in Bellevue. We also have supportive housing, which offers full services on site to anybody who lives there, whether it's job training, counseling, drug rehabilitation. Uh, they offer medical services. Um, we partner with Redmond and Kirkland 
Kirkland does women's shelters and Redmond does um, uh, like teenage okay. and young adult shelters. So we all work together to try to provide what the community needs. But I'll tell you, I do a ton of preventative work. I do a ton of preventative work. And that's one thing I'd like to see more around all, everywhere in the country is, you know, it's so much more affordable to stop someone from becoming homeless. It costs like thousand dollars. And to take someone out of homelessness and get them into stable housing costs a million dollars. And so it makes far more sense to try to identify people before they become homeless who are in crisis for whatever reason and try to figure out what, what's going on. And so we've been able to do that um, at, the, at the school level because we have agencies that work with families. And so a family will come in and say, you know, we can, we're not going to be able to afford rent next month. And so the the machine kicks in you know every everybody starts working toward yeah. how to make this family stable because um the biggest the the heart the what is it what do i want to say um biggest impediment to early childhood learning is stress and the biggest stressor in a child's life is unstable housing so if you allow families to be in the situation where they're moving all the time or they're sometimes living in the car, sometimes couch surfing, um, the kids just can't learn. You know, they really can't. And so that's not great for them and that's not great for our future. So it really behooves everybody to try to do everything we can to make these kids' lives stable so that they can learn and they can go on to jobs after they graduate. How much do you think it is people having an ego, right? For example, if I was homeless, I have plenty of people I could ask for help, but I wouldn't ask for anyone, right? I have too much pride, too much ego, right? How many you think it is like people having too much ego and pride to ask someone in their family or friends that, hey, I'm down on my luck, can you help me? I think that that's part of it for a little bit, but um, I wouldn't say that's probably okay. the majority. We do have a safe parking program for families and we've gotten a lot of families who are in that situation okay. who all they're paying for a rental truck and everything they own is in the truck. And they're just, you know, doing everything they can to get back into housing and they don't want anyone to know. And so they can go into our safe parking program and they have a building that has like a living room and they have a wardrobe for the kids and they have services and they go out and they try to help the parents navigate how to get back into stable housing. Another thing I don't think people think of, like someone loses their house or apartment or whatever, they have no address. Usually to apply for a job, you have to have an address, right? So oh, they, exactly. And they're going to catch 22. They don't even have a pen. Yeah. They don't, I, I, and it, it gets worse and worse for it's so It's so bad. But I mean, um, to um, be fair, only 10% of the housing in Bellevue was affordable to anyone earning less than 80% of the area median income. That's a pretty high rent. And so, you know, let's say you've got this job and then you lose your job and you're getting half the pay. Does that mean you no longer can live in your city? There's no choice for you. So the micro housing, the attached dwelling units, detached dwelling units, the affordable housing, we should have the full spectrum of housing types and affordabilities in the city so people can slide up and down the ladder. So before we move on, anything else you want to talk about the Bellevue plan for housing, affordable housing, anything else with this subject before we move on? I think I'm pretty much exhausted. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, next, um, before you were mayor, you actually owned your own physical therapy business, correct? For like 20 years. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about being a small business owner and how that helped you be a mayor? Oh, I don't know if it, if it did help me. you. I don't know if it helped me be a mayor. You want me to talk about my experience? I yes. can. Yeah, please. Um, so I was a physical therapist. And um, when I had kids, I really wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. But I also had worked so hard to get to this level because I'm a manual therapist that I it wasn't something I could just stop doing if I ever wanted to go back to it. So I was trying to keep my hands in the field. 
And um, I, when my son went to kindergarten, I started a business and I, he went to school on a Monday and on Wednesday I went to a doctor's office and I said, I have this idea for a business. Um, what do you think? And I got home and I had my first patient and it just took off from there. So I always was busy. I always uh, had, I was turning people away uh, for 20 years. I had a great business. I really enjoyed it. And so like, if you're a doctor, you might specialize, you know, I don't know, I can, you know, um, heart surgery. As a physical therapist, do you like specialize in like, you know, shoulder pain or like knee surgery or anything like that? Or are you a physical therapist, just a physical therapist? Um, physical therapist has to know everything, which is why it's such a difficult degree. But you certainly can specialize when you get out of school. And so um, there's cardio, cardiac rehab. That's a specialty. There's neuro and strokes and paralysis. That's another specialty. There's pediatrics. There's geriatrics, there's um, um, orthopedic, there's, you know, there's just tons of things. There's wound care, there's. Okay. Um, and did you like, did you sell your business? Did you like, was, oh what, God, this what? is one of my frustrations, Jason. You know, as a woman my age, uh, I haven't had a lot of guidance in life. I, I never got to do sports as a kid because they didn't let women do girls do sports until I was in eighth grade. So I didn't get all the coaching that people get growing up. And, um, you know, uh, I was expected to be either a flight attendant or a nurse or a housewife. Those were my choices. And you know what I really wanted to do? I wanted to be um, in the civil service, but I didn't know that. I didn't know what that was. And I would, I would describe what I wanted to do and it was exactly that. And so they said, well, you should be an international flight attendant. And so um, I know. So like, I don't mean to laugh a day. No, it's OK. <laughs> uh, so um, so I've had a lot of frustration in life of looking back and watching men uh, sell their business. I mean, I had a great business. I had a great referral base. I I thought about, you know, um, how I would sell it. And then I talked to somebody and it was just like all about how much money they were going to get off the transaction. It had nothing to do with me. And so I just wasn't interested in that. So I just quietly shut it shut down. Shut it down. And what year did you shut it down? Oh, let's think about this. 2018. Any, any, does it ever come to your mind, man? I should open this up again, get it running and then... No, it's a very hard job. Okay. Um, what I was doing, I was like um, the first person in with a patient and I had to identify a lot of crises, medical crises. And um, that takes a lot of, you have to be on all the time. And so the clients you had, I, I'm guessing you recommended them to go somewhere else or how to? Uh, yes. Okay. So by the time I retired, um, another agency had figured out what I was doing and they were doing the same thing. Okay. So I, I didn't leave any clients. I, I when when I, I just didn't take new clients okay. on. Okay. I got it. Um, any advice you can give to anyone starting a new business nowadays? Oh, just do it. You know, I mean, I, 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 what I loved about my business is I worked 10 to three. My kids never knew I had a job. <laughs> So I'd walk them to school and I'd walk them home from school and I would have been working the whole time they were at school. And so I, I had it both best of both worlds. And I just love that. You ever get this to start another business? Um, I am in a startup. Oh, that's right. We got to talk about that too. But yeah. I remember that now. Yeah. But I think for people who are interested in starting their own business, do it. Just really do it. it there's a, you know, there's a process. You need to go through, you really, you have to come up with a business plan and you need to shop it around and get a lot of feedback as to how viable it is. But um, I knew I had something because I was talking to somebody in my profession and we were both saying, you know, there's a need for something, for a certain type of physical therapy that nobody else does. And so it took me a really long time to figure out how to bill for it. it took me like a year. And I used to call Medicare up 
and I'd say, hi, I want to start my own business and I don't know how to bill for this. And they go, we're not, that's not our job. <laughs> and then I call back and I don't know how many people man the phones there, but I never got the same person twice. And I just would call every day and they'd say no for one reason or another. And finally one day somebody said, okay, I'll tell you. And they told me. Nice. Uh, next, can you talk about uh, a new program in Bellevue called Startup 425? Yes. So that's a collaboration between Kirkland, Redmond, and Bellevue. And uh, it's a small business support or uh, startup support. We have two founders on site who do mentoring, whether it's creating your business or trying to get funding for your business. They're, they'll give mentoring for that. And um, we, we specialize, or there's a special emphasis on women and minority-owned business owners. And is, is that is that an application process or something like that? Or like, do you only let 10 companies in? Um, I don't know. I know that uh, they just started a, a series and you had to apply for it. Okay. And I don't know how many they let in. Okay. But uh, I've talked to people who have done it and they've been really happy with it. So it's worth going on the City of Bellevue website. Okay, good, good. Um, and that's a pretty, pretty new program, right? Oh. Uh, it's been around for quite a while, for about eight years, I'd okay. say, but it's just recently evolved into something that I think is more relevant for people. And is that like a goal for the program? Is it a goal, like, you know, have like eight companies be successful and start uh, paying taxes to Bellevue city coffers or is, <laughs> or is the goal like, you know, something else? Or like, what's the success metric for it, if there is one? Oh, well, uh, I've never asked staff that question. I think, um, this isn't very impressive, but the goal is to see how many companies we help, how many businesses we help. But my personal goal would be that they get off the ground and that they, they grow in Bellevue. Yes. It would be great. Can you talk about your own startup? Well, I'm part of a startup. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about it. Okay. And we're, well, you know how startups go up and down. Yeah. We're in a down. Okay. And it's bumps same, me same, out. Same here. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about your startup. So it's a cabinet's HR. We've been doing it for a few years. You know, so basically we do HR for counties for 49 or fewer people. You know, like, because HR is different, different locations. Even HR is different from Seattle to Bellevue to, you know, Denver and Colorado. But most HR companies like Zenefits, Bambi, ADP, they send you templates, right? So you come to our platform, you answer a set of questions, and the, and the platform or the code, whatever you want to call it, does your handbooks, HR policies based on your questions answered. And then most companies like Zenefits, all these other companies, you might call on Monday, talk to Jason, Thursday, talk to Lynn. Each time is a different person, right? Bless is, is it be the same person each time. And so, yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. That sounds good. Well, maybe get into Startup 425 yeah. and maybe there'll be an event where you get to meet the Auth0 people mm -hmm. who want to hire somebody like you. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um. You also belong to the WTIA Association Blockchain Council. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? No, I'm embarrassed to say I don't think I've been to a meeting for a while, but um, I originally got involved in that because it's just all too apparent to me that there are a lot of people in government who know nothing about technology, and they're the ones making policy about it, and it's kind of scary. It's getting better. We have a few people who are carrying the water well, but um, I really wanted just to learn as much as I could about blockchain because everybody thinks of it um, as an MF NFT or Bitcoin, and there's so much more to it than that. And it's a great technology that the medical profession should be using, government should be using a lot. And I'm not talking about the, the mon monetary aspect of it, just as a technology that's a uh, secure um, a secure data that you can share and you only have to share whether somebody checked the box or not. So they, they always use the example when you go to a bar and you show them your driver's license, the only thing they need to know is if you're over 21, that you showed them everything about you. Yeah, you do. I never thought about it like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so blockchain merely says, yes, they checked the box. Okay. So whatever it is you need to know, here it is. <laughs> but you don't need to know anything else. But in you know, you think about when you go to a medical appointment, every time you have to sit down 
and fill out that huge form on your past medical history, what you're allergic to, what surgeries you've had, you know, what drugs you don't tolerate or what drugs you're on. And I mean, who remembers all that? And so they are only as good as you are accurate in that form. What if you put that on a card and so um, you go to your doctor and they want to know if you have any drug allergies or any food out or whatever, and it's all right there okay. and it's completely accurate. And I think that would save a lot of medical uh, mistakes. So we're on election year this year. As the mayor of Bell, does it really matter? Like if the Republicans or Democrats are running the, running the White House or the state governorship, like does that really matter as far as policy and stuff or? Yes. It does. Okay matters not as mayor it matters tremendously to a city like Bellevue I, it almost makes me cry because people don't realize so um, I was just reading an article uh, last week that reminded me of something that I'd forgotten about we had a bunch of environmental disasters with the fires that we had when uh, Trump was in the White House. And because Washington State has not been pro-Trump and certainly not the West side of it, they, didn't, they wouldn't give us any disaster money. They withheld disaster dollars. And it's not you know us in the government who are suffering, it's the people. Um, you think about, and this is where it gets really sad to me, you think about, you know, people who have come here to our country um, with good intentions to create an opportunity for their family and for their children. And they get them in the Bellevue School District. It's a very expensive place to live. They're managing it. The dad's working two jobs. The mom's working two jobs. They're part of a community. The kids are doing well. And ICE comes and just takes the dad one day and just takes him back to Mexico after he's been here for 20 years working no legal record or anything. And, um, you know, you ask yourself, well, why didn't they just get their citizenship or why didn't they do that? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but the, the repercussions of that kind of treatment to people like that, we had a family whose son committed suicide after his dad got deported. And, you know, there's a lot of suffering that goes on in our immigrant population, even the people who are legal, who are terrified of what's going to happen. So they go into hiding. So then we have people who are struggling. We don't even know. And they, they just disappear from your community and you don't know where they went, what happened to them. And when you meet these kids, they're good kids and they're leaders. You know, they're not the kind of people you want your, to lose from your community. So that's, I'm really worried about things like that. Okay. Um, I might be making this stat up, but I think like even during, even during the presidential election, really no one votes and even less vote in like local elections. And especially off year elections off-year, like yeah. mine. Can you talk about the importance of people like voting in all elections? Because I think the argument can be that the local elections impact your life way more than, you know, congressional elections. So thanks for asking that question. <laughs> Because I am in a nonprofit called the Eastside Voters Alliance, and it was a nonpartisan, get it, the vote out kind of thing. Everybody vote, and um, your your vote is your voice. You know, if you don't like something, then vote against it. If you do like something, vote for it. If you don't vote, you have no say over what's going on. If you think your vote doesn't matter, check out uh, the last primary that we just had in August, where we had Dave Up the Grove, who's a Democrat, and two Republicans running for a lands commissioner. And the, it, the, the vote count was separated by 50 votes. I mean, every vote matters. It really does. And you just, we fought so hard to have the ability to have a say in what our government does and in policy. Why would you not take advantage of that? I definitely agree. So what's your take on this? This is what I think, right? And you, you, of course you disagree if you want to. Like, I think on the left, there's like 1% of the left that's like way radical, like, like doing stuff like, okay, what are you doing? And on the right, 1% of the right, like, what are you doing, right? They're so radical on both sides. 
But it's like that 1% each time gets all the news media, all the attention, and they're driving everything, right? For most people, I actually, I won't say a moderate, they're mainly in the middle, right? Like 30, 40, 50, 60%, right? How does it come that the, all the news media like spending so much attention on these far left, right, 1%, far right, 1%? Because it's not boring. I mean, moderate is boring. Mm -hmm. And so they're selling news. But, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a very non-political person. And uh, I really had to think about, my dad was Republican, my mom was Democrat. And I really had to think about what party I wanted to be. Because when I was 18, I didn't really know the difference between the two. And I've uh, when I ran for office, I, again, had to really identify which party affiliation I was going to um, run with. And it came down to two things for me. Um, I share a lot of values in both parties. In the, I'm a real moderate, but there are two things that make me a Democrat, and that's just choice and gay rights. Okay. So. I think one thing the news does, too, they make it like, you know, if you're a Republican, you're you agree everything Republican or Democrat, everything Democrat. Like, I know plenty of Democrats are like pro-choice. You know, I know, I mean, you know, plenty Republicans. Republicans are pro-choice. And I have endorsed I, Republicans who are pro-choice, pro-gay rights. I know plenty of Democrats who are pro-guns, you know. Yeah. But it's like the news try to box us in this little box, so to speak, right? And yeah. no one's like that. No, and it's, it, what's sad is they're not talking to very many people, are they? No. Because those are the... I always think of the population as being the bell-shaped curve. Yeah, exactly. And so we should really, when we do policy, you really you need to listen to everybody, but you should, if you have to make a choice, make the choice for the middle of the bell-shaped curve. Yeah. But unfortunately, most politicians like making the choice for the loudest person, you know, or the you know most fundraising, I guess. Um, so in, how put this? So like, so I'm from Texas. And like most mayors, like they're, they're either Democrat or Republican. Is it the same here in, in like the Washington? It's like Washington, not really political, right? Well, so um, and the city council is nonpartisan. Okay. So you don't identify as either. Okay. And since mayor is a council role, no. Okay. All right. Um, what you have any, like any personal, professional political goals? Like you want to go be a U.S. state senator one day or like? <laughs> like I'd be telling you. Um no, I I um I wanted to go into the state senate. Okay. Very interested in that. But somebody I really admire and really support wanted that okay. seat and I stepped aside and okay. said and and I got the choice, which was really kind, but I said I'd rather support you and keep you in your Okay. in in that spot. And recently a Bellevue had something called a Bellevue International Festival. International festival. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Well, gosh, we have a a festival every weekend. We do, and so the international festival. I think that's primarily uh, like um, like India and and areas around India, but it's supposed to be. I think I remember. I think I remember seeing that. I remember the Bellevue for one day. I, I think I remember I was there for that. I was at the festival stuff. I saw everyone like kind of dressed up and like, okay. But um, yeah, I mean, we have international festivals all the time. We had a, the largest Ukrainian festival in the country um, last summer. And if we're into fall yet, I think, I don't know, but during the summer we had the largest Ukrainian. We, um, we have multiple Indian festivals. We have, Hindu festivals, we do, you know, um, Hispanic, we have um, the tango in the park, <laughs> you know, there's just lots of things going on. And what I love about it is um, there's always food, you know, um, cultural food and music and dance and the colors and, and it's like you're traveling, but you haven't had to leave your city. <laughs> Nice. Um, and I saw, I think it was on LinkedIn, where you, you talked to something called the Voices of Tomorrow Youth Panel on the Future of Tech. When was that? I think it was like about a month ago, I think. It was like a high school tech people, female females in tech, the high school. Okay, so um, that was last week, and that I was did the welcome for, and they had a high school, five high school 
girls who um, are interested in tech, and okay. they were on the panel. Okay, so you and just did the introduction. Okay. I just did the introduction, but that was really good to see. We need more of that. We had uh, people in the space industry. We had people in different industries attend that and talk to them after. And um, there were a couple of people there who were really interested in going into the aerospace industry that might not have had a path if they hadn't gone to that. So it was a little bit of a job fair. Okay. But it was also great for the people in the room to hear these students' points of view and their perspectives. So on your bio, you do a lot of volunteer work. Can you talk about maybe one or two of the volunteer things you do? Well, my job is practically volunteer because I barely get paid. Yeah, people forget about that part. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I used to do official volunteer work before I got into this job. And so I don't really have time to do anything more than I do in my role when I plant trees and I do litter pickup. And I, um, I went to Aegis Assisted Living last week and did a state of the city for them. I, I just love doing things like that. But I'm out in the community all the time offering my time. You know, my job's supposed to be a 20-hour a week, and it's more like 60. 20, yeah, I can imagine. Um, but I will say, I did do a lot of volunteer work um, my whole life from the time I was a child, my mom was really big into me doing volunteer work. And um, she always said, if you're feeling bad about yourself, then go help someone and you'll feel better. It's good advice. Yeah. And you're really being into nature too, right? Can you talk about your love for nature and how that plays in everything you're doing? I think I'm a water person. Yeah. So I water is, yeah, swim. that's my thing too, water, yeah. Like all your problems go away when you go to water. There you go. That's what I believe. Yeah. So have you ever done cold water swimming? Yeah. Have yeah, you? Yeah. So I do that too. Yeah. How cold have you gotten to? I don't know, to be honest with you. I couldn't tell you. We 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 take the temperature every time. So 38 was the coldest we've been. Mm. And um, that was pretty funny because my eardrums froze and I could only walk sideways. <laughs> <laughs> but um, starting in November, we every week we go with a group and we go swim in Lake Washington. Okay. So you have to join us at Maiden Bower Bay. Yeah. Um, do you do, do you do those cold plunging thing people are doing now where they like put all the ice in the bathtub and get in there? I don't do a plunge, okay. but uh, I actually go in and swim for about 15 minutes. And that's probably seen more like 15 hours with how cold it is. No, you know, it, you go in really gradually. And so it gets prickly for about 30 seconds and then you're warm because you're numb <laughs> and then you go in a little further and you get prickly and then you're numb and it's just there's a little bit of discomfort but it completely goes away and you end up when you come out it's like you're generating all this heat and you you feel almost euphoric you're it's a real um interesting response that the body has to the cold water so what do you want Bellevue to be known for like if someone says Bellevue, this automatically goes in their mind. I want Bellevue to be a place where anybody can go and have fun and feel like they belong. That's a great goal. Pretty great goal right there. Yeah. I mean, we there's so many things that we offer. Um, you know, one thing we have that people don't know about, we have, um, what do you call it when you get on a cable and you go, like zip, zip, line, lining. zip lining. We have zip lining at that, North Bellevue, and it's like two hours of zip lining from tree to tree, and that is so fun. And in sometimes in the fall they do nighttime zip lining with glow sticks. Oh wow! That and so fun. that's a totally different experience. So you don't you're not scared because you can't see how high up you are, <laughs> but then you have no perception and no spatial perception because mm -hmm. it's dark. So that that's kind of weird. Um, but if you like eating, there's every kind of restaurant you can imagine. We don't have Ethiopian. Now that I miss because I was, I've been to Ethiopia twice and I love the food. So we need a good Ethiopian restaurant in Bellevue. But other than that, I think we have everything. Um, every weekend, either at the park in the summer or at Maidenbauer Center, there's some cultural event that anybody can go to. 
And that's what I love about Bellevue. Anybody can go to anything. And and I always say you can do anything legal in the park you want as long as, <laughs> as, long as I'm invited. <laughs> That's funny. So um, this might not be your lane, but like, how do you entice businesses to both stay in Bellevue or come to Bellevue? What do you mean that's not my lane? I mean, that's my whole raison d'être. <laughs> I mean, it's you think about what attracts people to your city, and to me. It's a high quality of life. So safe environment, high public safety, clean utilities, good water, good air, access to parks and green spaces, and excellent public education, access to health care. Those are the things that give you a high quality of life and then opportunity. So that attracts our employees, which in turn attracts the employers, because we have what they call a mature workforce where people, once they're there, when they change jobs, as people invariably do, um, they stay in the city, they stay in the region. And so we have really experienced people uh, that you can hire from. And so that attracts our companies. And so we don't do any bribery. We don't do any tax breaks or anything for our big companies, but we do ask them to be partners with us. So Amazon has been a really good community partner to Bellevue. They have contributed to affordable housing, as has Microsoft. They contributed to our human services during COVID. They have helped um, fund a lot of little events like the Autism Fun Run and little things where you have a buffet at the side. It's paid for by Amazon. I mean, they're they're really everywhere supporting the city. And I really wanted their employees to be a part of the community. I wanted them to be able to live where they work and not just commute in and out. And they've been working with us. We've, we've created a lot of multimodal transportation options. We're doing the workforce housing. And, you know, they don't just bring in high earning employees, they bring in a whole service industry to support them as well. And so we need to create housing for those jobs as well. So follow up question, like, of course, I, I look at all your LinkedIn stuff and someone did a, a post and you made a comment on the post was basically like, you know, about Amazon making people come back to work. Oh, you and just you, did that today. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I, 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 you had a good point. I think people forget like when people remote work, all those businesses, they lose customers, lose business, right? I don't think anyone's thinking about that. You had a great point too, I think, where remote work's good. However, if you're like fresh out of college, like who's mentoring you, right? Yeah. And like, also you're like, you're out of college and you're at work and you know, your boss is zooming in. Like, what kind of look is that, right? I don't think that's a good look. You know, I, I am so frustrated with our generation. I mean, we have absolutely screwed the younger generation. I just, it really makes me sad. People like, what are the chances of them ever owning a home? They, they've created the shared economy because they had to. And so um, you, you think about people our age are love remote work. I mean, who doesn't want to work from home when you don't have to go in and you can, you can accomplish just as much remotely as you can in person, you feel. What about all those people up to maybe age 30 who this is their first job? The, they're just out of college. First job, maybe they change careers or. Yeah. And they don't know the ropes. They don't know the office etiquette. They don't know, you know, how do you move something forward? Everybody has ideas. Nobody just does what they're told. They need to be able to interact. They need to be able to collaborate and they need to have that you know, water cooler conversation where you say, hey, you know, I really want to do this someday. And somebody says, here's how to get there. Yeah. You're not doing that with a one hour a week meeting over Zoom. No, you're all in your own, own little silos. And I know that I believe me as a woman, I totally appreciate the support for a flexible work. When I was working and I had kids, if my kids were sick, I didn't work that day. And I didn't get a salary for that day. And so um, that can take a, that can have a huge impact. So being able to work from home while your kids are sleeping or is a great opportunity, or if you have to take them to appointments, having a flexible work schedule 
But for the norm, I think it's better for everybody to feed off of each other, if not for anything other than the energy, because we're like sharks. We have energy going back and forth all the time that you do not get over Zoom. Yeah, my thing too, like, suppose all these stats show the remote work is more production. Like, are people really being honest, right? Like me, I can't work remotely, right? I just can't do it, right? Because I'm working remotely. I'm having 25 snacks a day. Oh. <laughs> I'm binge watching Netflix, you know. I'm taking a nap to an afternoon, you know. I have to go somewhere. Now, do I want to go somewhere with a two-hour drive each way to a cubicle, eight to five every day? No. Probably not, right? No. And that's such a good point, Jason. It's, it's a, it's both sides have to work together to create something that is successful for everybody. So yeah, we need people in our cities. We need people to support our businesses because that's what my post said is, you know, uh, we need the presence in our downtown. Um, but we can't expect people to cut into the quality of their life, which is any commute more than 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And you think about when you have kids, I don't know, I didn't have to do this, but oh my gosh, the people who get up at 5 a.m., get their kids to daycare at 6 a.m., and then they get into the office at 8. Um, that's that's ridiculous. And their kids are in daycare, you know, 12 hours of the day or more. That's one thing that we've figured out, fortunately, is how important daycare is. Yeah. And so we are really encouraging Amazon to put daycare in their buildings, but it's open to everybody. And that we are doing programs that support the creation of private daycares. So somebody can convert their house into a daycare and create a business. So there's a company that will help you do that. Um, And uh, Bellevue College has a daycare certification program. So daycare is very important part of the uh, piece of the puzzle. Is there a business or industry that Bellevue is working on right now to kind of entice a company to Bellevue that you can talk about? Pardon? It's like a business or industry like you're, like you're working with the bring to Bellevue right now? Yes. Bio, biotech. Biotech, okay. Big time. We have all this, these office campuses along I-90 and Eastgate that are just perfect. They have huge floor plates. They're perfect for the biotech industry. And I, I think recently uh, South Sound started a link rail from, from Bellevue to Redmond, I think. Yes. How's that working out? You know, surprisingly popular. Okay. Uh, obviously, it's supposed to go to Seattle. And uh, we had all that all the issues. <laughs> Sound Transit did. We didn't. Um, they had workers during COVID. They claimed that they didn't. It was because of COVID that they didn't do good workmanship. I don't know. Okay. Uh, but we ha- they had to undo everything that they did and mm. redo it. it. Had spalling and concrete, what that is. Um, so they had to jackhammer that all out without destroying the base, mm. the foundation, and repour it. And um, we said, "Well, do you think we could at least get it going between Bellevue and Redmond?" Yeah, right. And it's a miracle yeah. that they said yes. And it's a great ride. I don't know if you've done it, but I ride my no. bike a lot. And I can go anywhere because um, light rail goes through the areas that are really hard to ride your bike. And so if I can just get to a light rail station, take my bike on it and pop out close to where I want to be and just ride to it, it's great. What What's your plan? What's the future for public transportation in, in Bellevue? Is like add more bus lines, more link rail, like more bike lanes? Well, the first goal is to get it light rail open across the bridge. Mm-hmm. And that's going to happen next year. Okay. We really want to get done before FIFA. That'd be, that'd be, that's a good goal. That'd be great. That is, that is the goal. And Angela Bernie, the mayor of Redmond, she's on it. She's going to, if, if it's possible, it will happen. And she's the driver on that. That's a good question. So obviously Seattle's going to get benefit from FIFA coming here. How, how does towns like Bellevue get a big time? Big, big, it'll be huge. Okay. Yes. We will get a lot of tourism dollars from it. Nice, nice. A lot of people will stay, especially if light rail is working. Mm-hmm. A lot of people will stay in Bellevue and just commute over to the game. And then how do you prevent this? I don't know if you can. Like, how do you prevent people like, not price gouge, but, you know, like, okay, a, a beer might cost $5. Do a fee for they make it $15, right? Or maybe an apartment is 
three thousand a month. They make the like the Airbnb eight thousand, right? Is there a way to prevent this or just part of like taking advantage of the, all the tourism coming here? The wrong person to ask since I stand to take advantage of the price gouging. Okay. If it happens. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Um yeah, I don't know. I mean, how do you go to Pebble Beach and watch the golf yeah. tournament? You're going to pay a lot of money. I think you make a reservation really early. Early, okay. Two years in advance or something, and you, you get in there when you can, or you find a friend. Um, back to transportation. I don't know if you know about um, East Trail in Bellevue. It's this incredible uh, north-south head bike trail that they took a old uh, BNSF railroad tracks and converted it into this multimodal transportation bike ped. Um, it goes from um, Renton all the way up through Kirkland, through Woodenville, all the way to Woodenville, through Bellevue. Um, it's not complete in Bellevue yet. We, it has to go over that really old trestle. Um, and we have the money to make that possible but we have a lot of work to do but they've started working on it and we have to get over i-90 it's there's a lot that we have to do but when but we, you can go around those areas now so you still you can get on it and then get off and then get back on it that's going to be such a gift to the community i was using it to see patients when it was, went from bellevue to renton i had a patient in renton just get on my bike and just cruise down there and cruise back. Never go have to worry about cars. That's great. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, can you talk next about, the, so in 2014, the city of Bellevue adopted a 20 year vision. Can you talk about that? Is like, is that on go right now or? So that's the comprehensive plan. Yeah. And we're redoing it right now. Okay. So it's a, it's a 40 year vision with a 20 year plan that we renew every 10 years. Okay. Um, who's all involved with that? The city council, economic people, like who comes together for that plan? Oh, well, it's, it's every department. Okay. And, um, but it's mostly the planning department and it's mostly development. And so you're looking at what are we going to allow? What do we want to see in 40 years in Bellevue? You know, what do we hope the city to be like? Do you want a lot of parkland along with your buildings? How tall do you want your buildings to be? What kind of industry do you want in here? Um, it just, you just look at that and then you start thinking, okay, if we want that, then how do we get it? We have to allow increased height and we have to start procuring certain percentage of parkland um, to maintain that ratio between people and green space. And all the things that you think about the multimodal transportation, you know, you're going to put in more roads, you're going to take out roads, you're going to speed up traffic, you're going to slow it down. Lots of things to think about, but you got to start with the, what you want to see at the end and work backwards. And so we're doing that right now. We've basically, I think, approved the comprehensive plan, the two phases, and they're going to bring it back for the final vote. We used our planning commission a lot to help us with that. They did a lot of work on the comp plan, and I really appreciate it. We have an amazing group in the planning commission right now. And so you're redoing, so you're redoing it this year, correct? Yes. And so like in 2025, is it like another meeting where you like? It'll it? be formally adopted probably. Okay. And then we do all the land use codes to okay. complement what we just allowed. So... And you do like do a yearly meeting, like make sure you're still on track for with the plan or huh. like, you know, like 2025. Okay. We say we're going to do this in 20 years. Based on what we've done so far, are we on track, not on track? We do do reviews. reviews I don't yeah, know yeah. how often we do them, but we do a lot of reviews quarterly. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, like with Wilburton, when I was talking about, we got we have to get housing. We have to get affordable housing in Wilburton. If in two years that's not happening, we're definitely going to stop and go, okay. what's going on here? Well, the city of Bellevue, like, I have no idea how many people live there, but what's the limit? 152,000. Like, what's too many people for Bellevue? Like, suppose, like, 100,000 more people came in. That'd be too much. Or, like, how do you, like, manage growth, so to speak? Um, well... Let's look at it this way. 
we, the Growth Management Act kind of dictates what every city has to accommodate. And uh, we are planning to accommodate 35,000 new people and our, let's see, what is it? 35,000 new jobs and 70,000 new housing. Then you, you have to make sure there's enough schools, the, the roads can handle all those people, all those like different things, right? Yeah. And um, we have to plan for that. So, and people don't realize the downtown is only 70% built out. Mm. We still have Bell Red. We still have Wilburton. We still have Eastgate. We still have Factoria. We have a lot of room to grow in Bellevue, but how are you going to manage all those people when they come? So light rail will help, but that last mile transportation is going to be challenging. So we have something called Bellhop, which is an electric shuttle that you can hail like an Uber and it's free. Okay. And it will take you from light rail to your destination in certain areas. It doesn't serve entire city, but it has certain areas that it serves. Is Bellevue College only like higher education college in Bellevue? Um, or is it something I'm missing? There's another one there. I, gosh, that's a good question. I think there's a private okay. one, but um, in terms of public, they partner with Bothell, Bothell okay. and they partner with UW, okay. and it's, it's kind of the same with okay. UW Bothell. Um, so, yes. I would say yes. So Bellevue has a really good reputation as far as the public schools, right? How, how did that come about? Is this like incentives for, edu for the education system? I mean, this didn't happen, right? I mean. I you know, I have nothing to do with it. So I don't really know. Okay. I will say that people value a good education for the children. I think people appreciate that the children are the future. And so there's a Bellevue Schools Foundation that raises quite a bit of money to supplement the state funding in the ways that they can. There's rules on how you can do that. But I think that there's a lot of volunteers at the schools and they have very high standards. You know, people want a good education for their kids. And so um, the thing that I'm really pleased about is they were threatening to close two more schools in Bellevue and the superintendent, who I just think the world of, uh, Kelly Aramaki, he put a pause on it and they did open enrollment and we're growing really fast again. So we're getting more students than they expected to. Nice. Yeah. So on the city of Bellevue website, there's a thing called a um, performance dashboard, which I guess like has metrics help run the city, whatever. Can you talk about that and how you use that to improve the city? You know, I don't use that. That's okay. for the, the, the residents. Okay to look at. And, um, you know, we get reports back from staff. And so I use those reports more okay. than I use this dashboard. Okay. But so it's the feedback, you know, um, we do, we, every year we go out and we ask the community, what are you liking about Bellevue? What's not working for you? It's not open-ended, you know, it's a, how, how, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how much, do you like this or whatever? And, um, you know, we get a feel for how people uh, are adapting to a changing community. So what metrics do you like to track as far as it being a mirror? Like, Oh, well, I track the children who are homeless. Okay. That's a huge one for me. And understand that in the Bellevue School District, the definition of homeless is very different than what yours and mine would be. So in the school district, homeless is anybody who doesn't have their own place where they live. So like, like you can't be living at your grandma's house right. or couch surfing on someone's couch. You have to have your own, your, you, your mom, your dad have to be, you know, paying the bill, so to speak. Yes. Okay. Right. So it has to be stable housing. And I get that. That's really important, but it's not the same as living in a tent. Mm -hmm. So I look at who's outside, you know, who, who do we need to get inside? What's their demographic? How do we how do we approach them, and how do we get them what they need to get become stable? So that's a stat that I look at. I look at the office vacancy. I look at um, unemployment. I look at um, you know the approval ratings. 
of the city and the and the departments, um, things like that. So you know, whether good or bad, most cities like when you think of a city government, you think of bureaucracy, right? How do you like make sure that it, there's at least amount of bureaucracy as possible for the citizens of Bellevue? Oh well, here's one simple thing I do. Um, most cities for public comment at the meeting say that you have to speak to something on the agenda. And, you know, sometimes you get somebody who's a uh, water bill they can't pay. And they don't know where to go, so they go to the city council meeting. Are you going to tell them they can't talk to you because it's not on the agenda? So that's one thing that I do not require, that anything has to be on the agenda. It does have to require to be something that has to do with the Bellevue City Council. Can't complain about the royal family in England. <laughs> so do you... And other council members have like some kind of open door policy where people just go to your office when they want to or call you or email when you want to? You know, anybody can email anyone whenever they want to. Everybody has a council email, but I'm the only one who has set office hours. And so, hate to say this online, but call this, the city and set up an appointment and I'll meet with you. Nice. Um, and I'm really busy. Like they're full. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, can you, can you talk about some of your mentors you've had through your life? You know, um, surprisingly, I say surprisingly, cause I didn't recognize it until recently. What an incredible mentor my mother was for being progressive. My mom was from Canada and she really got what a short end of the stick that she had as a woman, the inability to, um, you know, have a profession and be a mom. Um, the fact that she never really could lead a conversation in a mixed group. Um, the one thing I remember is um, watching the Billie Jean King tennis match with Jimmy Connors. And my mother, like we, I never got to watch TV during the day. And I remember she turned that on. It was a big deal. And she smoked one Virginia Slim's cigarette because that was the sponsor. And she sat down and we watched that. And when Billy Ch Jean King won that match, my mom was just in shock. And she just kept saying, can you imagine? Can you imagine? So she was a big mentor for that. I would say my, my dad, my brother, my husband, especially my husband, uh, has been an incredible mentor for me because, again, as I said, I never got coached. I never had business classes. I There's a lot of things I didn't know coming into this job. I don't know how to, I didn't know, I hope I do now, how to function well at a meeting. You know, I didn't. I had all these ideas and I was so excited. And then next, like, who are you mentoring right now? Oh, well, I will mentor anybody I can, because again, the kids are our future. So I show up to a lot of youth events and I make myself available. And I usually have about three high school students who I'm tracking who have reached out to me and, and I try to keep tabs with them. And um, I think I loaned one high school student a, a, a dress I had for a formal that she was going to. Nice. <laughs> Hope she, hopefully she didn't look frumpy in it. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned earlier, like, you know, how you were coming up, you know, you were getting coaching, you know, as a female entrepreneur, as a female in general. Do you think it's gotten better for females now? Or is it like, has times changed or is it still like, you know, uh, still behind the power curve, so to speak? If that makes any sense? No, I no, I mean, we have still have a, it's still a man's world in case you wonder, Jason. <laughs> it is still a man's world. I, I get frustrated every week or something or another. And it's just, it's just the way it is, but it is much, much better. There is far more opportunities. There are people out there who recognize that they need to give people a hand up and it's not automatic. It's not a level playing field at all. And so anytime uh, anybody sees a woman who has potential, who's smart and, and, you know, could do well if they had the opportunity, you got to give them the opportunity. You've got to make it work. And sometimes that woman has a child and just can't perform like 
a guy can perform at the office. And so having that flexible schedule for that person, letting them have some kind of flexibility so they can maintain a, a job and keep working their way up the ladder. That's really important. And what's your advice on this, right? So like, so there's, a, there's a female out there. She's married. She's like having a very really successful career and she has to decide, okay, I want to have kids. Like, how do you like, but do I do have a kid now? Do I wait? You know, uh-huh. like, because the military has a big thing in the military. A lot of army females, they're postponed having a kid and they're all getting married all right. And then before they know they're 40 years old and the army's whole career, or, or they'll be like, you know, they have the kids early and then they get out of the military, right? So that's the big thing with the army right now. Gosh, I have no idea. I've never thought about yeah. that. Um, it would make sense to me that they would have a child care at the facility where that person's enlisted so they can yeah, take their kid with they them. They do, but it costs a lot of money just like it does an outside. And well, then, they should offer it for free. Yeah. It should be part of the yeah. job. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not. Yeah, well, that makes it almost impossible. Yeah. I remember when I had my first child and I wanted to keep working just enough to keep my skills up. Um, I worked eight hours a week, two four-hour days, and I was paying $24 more a month for all the child care than I was earning. Wow. <laughs> um, any advice for any alone who wants to start a business? I know you said start it now, but anything... Besides that? Well, I think it depends on the business. Okay. I'm sorry. No, no worries. I can't think of it like a panacea. Yeah. How does, how does Bellevue uh, influence people like to start their own businesses? Well, I probably with the startup 425. Um, One thing I did when I first got into office, this is great. There was an old building and I convinced our economic development person or maybe it was the development services person to turn it into a low cost incubator. And so um, you could, if you, you could pay really low office rate and have your own office there. And that was very, that was full. That was very successful. We kept that going for four years and then sound transit tore the building down because that was the deal. Are there any, any events coming up in Bellevue in the next couple of months that you want people to know about? Or the Arts Festival or oh, anything else going on? If you're an artist, the Bellevue Art Museum is um, doing a winter art fair and they're accepting applicants from artists right now. So that'll be fun. And um, as we move into the winter and we get the ice house out in this downtown park and Snowflake Lane and the lights in the botanical garden, those are all super fun things to do. Um. Is there any one thing you want Bellevue to be known for? Do you want Bellevue to be known for like a, like a place for business or, a, or arts or nature? Like you got to pick up only one thing. I think high quality of life high quality and of all life. that that entails. That's all over, yeah. You know, and I, I omitted access to the arts. I should put that in my definition because that's part of it. Yeah. So, you know, we have to, that has to be intentional. Yes. Those things don't just happen. That that's intentional planning and intentional budgeting. And we just need to keep doing that. So you mentioned you traveled to Ethiopia earlier. Have you any, any, any new travel places kind of you want to go to? Not a big traveler. Okay. I've never been able to do that. I've, I've like, I took my first 10 day vacation last month in years uh, for our, my husband's birthday. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a big deal. But um I, I hope, I hope in my future that I do some more traveling. Nice, nice. Um, so with, with Bellevue, so you mentioned earlier like there's like Ukrainians, of course, any, like a big Indian community. What's like a minority group there that people don't know about? That people like, like, like for the longest time, I didn't realize Seattle had a big civilian community, right? I didn't know that, right? Mm. We haven't really attracted the African immigrant community like Seattle has probably because we don't have um, enough low income housing to accommodate them. And we don't have a community when you, once you have a community, then you're going to add a whole lot of people to it. So uh, we have a growing Hispanic population that a lot of people aren't aware of or whatever that's worth. I mean, I don't think you have to be aware of it, but 
Um, but we are one of the most diverse cities of our size in the country. We okay. have over a hundred languages spoken here. Oh wow! And Bev, you all consider like a mid mid sized city, middle sized city. Are there like competitions like across the United States, like best mid sized city? Oh yeah, that y'all compete for, or like want to win or try I mean, to win. You know, it, there's a million magazines and and organizations that will decide where you rank in what way and you know i don't know how you how you gauge how accurate they are but when we score high you bet i like that yeah exactly uh and do you have a term limit or like can you be the mayor permanently forever or is it no there's no term limit okay. but i will tell you this is my last time being mayor okay yes what You're... if they beg you to stay on like no. please Please, please, please. No. We'll do whatever you want. Please it's, stay on. It's my job to get the next people ready. Okay. So I'm working on doing that. And so your replacement will, will be someone who's currently on the city council? Well, I should hope so. Okay. I should hope they wouldn't put a brand new person. Okay. That would be pretty tough. Yeah. And like you said earlier, you, you, you hire the city manager. So do you like manage that person or they work for you or they work for the whole council? You only hire them. Oh, they work for the whole council. Okay. And so base the city manager base has like what four or five bosses, so to speak. Pardon? So base the city manager has like four or five bosses, so to speak, since they work for the whole council. Well, the city manager, uh, I will, you know, the council has like a city clerk. They have council coordinators who just work with them. Mm -hmm. But the city manager is in charge of all the staff of the city, okay. all the employees in the okay. city. They're in charge of the budget. They're in charge of utilities. They're in charge of running the city okay. and running the people who run the so city. So basically, like a, it's almost like a chief of operations for the city? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. How often do you have to go to like the Olympia, like, you know, to either like lobby someone there or like and go to a meeting? Okay. Yeah, quite a bit. Is that a fun part of your job? Not so fun? Oh, uh, it's, it's easy because I know everybody. Okay. You know, I've been doing this long enough that, and they've been in their jobs long enough that we all know each other very well. So I see them all the time. And so when I go to Olympia or DC, it's just seeing them in an official capacity. Okay. And so it's, it's fun. So this is an off, off the wall question. But how often does the city of like practice like emergency preparedness? Like, like, is it like a, some kind of drill, like the big earthquakes come in, you know, or, or the volcano erupted? Like how often does that happen? Well, there's two answers to that. The city itself is always planning for that, especially the earthquake. And so I don't know about if we plan for the eruption, um, but the earthquake is, is a real, um, we're, it's not an if, it's a when. And so we're currently working on um, reinforcing our water supply. Okay. So that if one part of it were to go out in an earthquake, we might have another part that, that brought us the water. But if the both of them go out, we are actually, um, Be Bellevue is like a marsh. It's a very wet place. And so there's a lot of well water. And so we're trying to create four main wells that okay. have clean water that we could rely on if we had to. Okay. Um, but we do have a emergency response coordinator. And so the city is constantly trying to get the community to have backup water. I mean, gosh, look at what happened to Asheville. I mean, other I cities as well. But Yeah, the whole area. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Just, I have a friend who insane. just moved there last year. And, every, you know, every it was like old Bellevue getting washed out. Everything quaint that they loved about this community, the reason they moved there is gone. Yeah. And no fresh water. He actually has to go down to the creek and collect water out of the creek and, and bring it back to the house and boil it. Um, they just got internet, thanks to T-Mobile. Yeah. T-Mobile actually sent crews out there to bring their internet. Don't think they have power yet. And it's just, I mean, devastating. It so is. It you, is. You have to be prepared for that potential. And, and that friend of mine had a lot of water in the house, okay. fresh water, but it only lasted two weeks, so already yeah water can go fast yeah yeah so it is important and they have uh, monthly publications that come out of the city that talk about mer emergency preparedness but here's something jason you know what bellevue doesn't have 
they don't, I mean, we have a Bellevue reporter. We don't have a, I'm sorry, Bellevue reporter. You don't have a newspaper? We don't have a newspaper. I, I didn't realize that. We do not have a newspaper. And the thing that kills me is that a lot of the only information people get is on next door. And how accurate is that? I mean, I, I can't even read it because when I read it, I get so upset to think that people actually believe this. And then I want to correct them. And then I can't do that because then it's like. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize that. And so in Seattle Times barely, barely covers Bellevue. Um, and so we really need our city is big enough. And, yeah, you know, we're is. the second biggest economy in Washington state. I think we're important enough that we need a, a no, newspaper. newspaper. I didn't realize that. So how do you, how do you as a mayor keep people informed, right? Cause like they'll say, you know, go to the website. No one's going to the Bellevue website, you know, but you can say send emails or bulletins. Like how do you make sure people stay informed best you can? Well, well, here's a, here's a public service announcement for me. Get, if you live in Bellevue, get the My Bellevue app. That is the best resource for people. Um, if you, if there's a pothole, you open the app, you, push a button, it drops a pin and sends it to the maintenance department and that that'll be fixed in a week. If there's somebody who needs housing and you're concerned about them, same thing. Our homeless outreach coordinator will come out and talk to them and see if they're okay. Um, if you have a non-emergency re police report, if you want to, if you're, I had a call this morning. The first call I had this morning was somebody who was concerned about um, some personal crime in their neighborhoods and they wanted to talk to the sector captain said, download the app. There's a little thing you can push and you can contact your sector cap captain and they'll reach out to you. So that's one way that we have um, people can, can communicate with the city. But in terms of information, I mean, we have um, a monthly newsletter that goes out to everybody we, um, anytime we have a public hearing or we want to get public input, we do major snail mail, flyers, internet, anything we can. We post on social media to get people aware that this is an opportunity to weigh in. I mean, I would say having a pothole filled in less than a week, that's something you all should be bragging about, you know, because most cities like, you know, have a pothole for like months and stuff, you know. Well, here's another thing to brag about. The emergency response times are under three minutes. Oh, wow. That's very impressive. It is. I mean, that's to me is a sign of success. Mm -hmm. If you can maintain that, then you're doing something right with your emergency services. That's very good. Three minutes from anywhere in Bellevue. Yeah, that's that's on wow. average. Wow. That's very impressive. So I might already asked this before, but like, what are you most proud of so far? What you've done as a mayor? Can you point to one thing like, yeah, I did my thing on this? Like, Well, one thing I'm proud of that I did when I was uh, on the parks board is as a physical therapist, I came in and I would take my patients to the park and I'd have to go where the dumpsters were to get into the park because that's where the curb cutout was. And then it was, there was always a lift. So they had the curb by the trash can. Yeah. Okay. So everybody else gets the <laughs> grand entrance and, and we would have to go by the dumpster and then it was hard to get over the little lip. And so uh, I insisted that they make every park universal design. So the first park that they made when I was on the parks board was the Maidenbauer okay. Bay Park and that's all accessible. And then ever since then, anything they do on a park, it's all accessible. So even the downtown park, the two new portions that they put in are accessible. So I don't know I'm going to ask this question the wrong way, but how you deal with this? Like suppose, of course, everyone's concerns or issues are legit and they're important, right? But how you deal with like someone like, and you're like, okay, here's Jason Cabs again with another complaint, with another, you know, you saw my complaints all the time. They're really like complaints. Like how you deal with people like me who are like, okay. I block you. You block you? No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. Don't do that. I'll, I always because I mean, that does take a time away from you from well, dealing with real concerns, right? I mean, usually people have a point, you know, and so I definitely listen to it or I'll read the email. But again, I focus on the bell shaped curve. 
And if you're on the outer edges and you're the only person who's having this problem, I'm probably not <laughs> going to de devote a ton of time to it. Now, I've had issues, situations where I've actually driven to someone's house because they want me to see something that's going on on their street. And uh, it's hard to know until you see it. So I, I do that. I mean, that's a little different because you can have an individual problem that nobody else is having because of what's going on in your area. So that's that's legit. But if you, uh, there's some things that people complain about that other people don't see as being a problem. Yeah. What if like someone complains, like how do you do like a high level complaints against a certain department? Like someone says, the water department's not doing this, parks department not doing this. Do you like, you let you you that, you let between that department and that person, or do you get involved in any kind of way? Um, I will always direct it to the department head. And if I do that, then they will answer the person. So I want to make sure it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. Okay. Um, so you were a big mentor young people. So what, and we talked about this earlier, how the young people now like kind of screwed, right? Like they can't afford housing and all this kind of stuff. Like one more time, I saw us somewhere where it said like, like our generation telling a young generation, you know, if you don't spend so much money on avocado toast, you'll afford something. And the reply was, this all I can afford to eat is avocado toast, right? You know, this is all I can, I can afford, right? How do we like give back the American dream to these young people? Or you think that's just a point of no return, unfortunately? No, it's not. There's a lot we can do. Um, if you look at the data, you look at over the last 40 years, the cost of living has gone up like 40%. And the cost of housing has gone up 200%. The average salary has gone up 18%. Okay, there's, that's not a, as, the, as our developers say, that doesn't pencil out. So I don't know what people are thinking when they create a society where this is the norm. Everybody needs to earn, anybody willing to work 40 hours a week needs a living wage. If they're worth you hiring, then they're worth getting paid. And I hate this idea that we can pay people $15 an hour because I don't know, you know, it's just, and, and, and another thing, and, and now this is just me talking as an individual. I don't think people should be able to get ri rich off of basic necessities. So you shouldn't be able to get rich off of healthcare. You shouldn't be able to get rich off of housing shouldn't be able to get rich off of education. And somehow we've found a way to monetize all three of those things. Yeah, especially the medical part, the big farmers and stuff like that. You know, you look at, at me as a health professional, how many people are between me and the patient if I work in a clinic? I mean, it used to be there was the office manager and me and, and the person who did the billing. That was it. And the the owner of the company. Now you have like 15 people who all want to get rich. And do you know that as a physical therapist, my salary, if I were working for somebody has not changed and maybe has even gone down. The reimbursement's gone way down from the eighties. No, no idea. I mean, it's a hard job. It's, it took years out of my life to get this degree and then constant continuing education. And somehow these um, white collar workers come in to the middle and decide that they, de they deserve to get rich off of my work that I do. And of course, I hear the horror stories where like someone needs to get something medical done and the insurance company automatically says no. And then you have to prove to the insurance company to build well, it. Well, that's a whole nother story. Okay. But I mean, you're right. But the fact is, physical therapy is about $300 an hour. Physical therapist gets paid $60 an hour. What? Tell me why. So $250 over 70% is like admin costs. That makes no sense at all. So when I had my business, and it was just me, and I went to patients' homes, I had no overhead. That was a good business. I did my own billing. That's, that's crazy. I had no idea. Yeah. And it has recently started doing that. It's always been like that. So to speak. Ever since they started buying up 
all the privately owned physical therapy practices and making them into groups. Here's something else I don't agree with, right? I think somebody gets a law. You have like all these big corporates like BlackRock, like buying up homes now to, oh. rent, to rent them out. You know, funny thing about that, when you when people talk about it, it's like, oh, that sounds horrible. But I don't know if I can believe the data I've seen, but it's a very, very small percentage of homes that are being affected. Okay. Um, yeah, they shouldn't be doing that at all. Yeah. And I, I, I get an email call every day from someone trying to buy my house. Oh, well, good for you. But um, yeah, because I, I don't think that that is the biggest thing is the biggest problem okay. with our housing. Okay. Crisis, and it is a crisis. So we need to build more housing. We're ten years behind in our building. We had like a stall for ten years, and so we're behind. And then we need to create that affordability, the whole spectrum. We can't just be building mega single family homes in Bellevue. And so I'd love to see a big house come down and three cottages go up. Okay. That would make me happy to triple the amount of families that can live in the neighborhood. Is there a way that we can change? Like, I think like, like I was, in, I was in the army, so I had like a VA loan, no, no nothing down. Right. Most like civilians have to pay 20% down or pay mortgage insurance, right? right? You think we can change that or is this, of course, I mean, I'm sure banks will say, don't keep it in there because we're taking a risk and stuff like that. But 20%, most people don't have 20% for house, I don't think, these days. So um, I'm going to just shift for a second to rentals. You're talking about home ownership. There's an amazing company called The Housing Connector. And anybody who is having trouble finding a rental that they can afford, check them out. They will um, help you pay the first and last month payment. They will offer insurance that will guarantee that you will make your payments or they'll make it for you if you don't make it one month. And so you get a lower rate when there's more assuredness for the landlord. So that's, a company that I just love. Is that local in Seattle? It's like nationwide. Yeah, it's local in Seattle. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so that I'm real, a real fan of that company and that's a great resource for people. I think what you're talking about is really interesting. I don't really know enough about ho housing finance to know the pros or cons of what you're saying, but I do know that there is a state initiative called the Black Home Initiative where they're trying to create home ownership for um, families that have a history of being um, held back from home ownership. And so that is something that they do is they reduce those payments. So okay. you don't have those. So I think it is a worthy idea and it can be very successful. So you mentioned earlier about living wage. Is a living wage based on some amount of money or is it like, should it be different based on location or like how does that come up? Yeah, it's based on location. Okay. So living wage in Bellevue is $30 an hour. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, people might say it's a lot of money, but really it's like $30 an hour is not a lot of money. Well, if you pay people more, they can spend more. And so if you want to increase what things cost, you're getting paid more, you can afford it. Yeah. We have this thing where we want to keep costs way, way down. We want to keep wages way, way down. But the thing I didn't tell you is that the average CEO salary has gone up 200%. Yeah, easily. I mean, that's not the cause of everything, but it's a mindset that we have. My dad had his own business in San Francisco, and he paid everybody a living wage, gave everybody a retirement package, paid everybody's health care. And when he sold the company, he put a caveat that said they couldn't fire a single worker that he had originally okay. had in this who had worked there more than 20 years and it made it hard for him to find a buyer for his company in fact nobody would buy it so so, people, they want to buy a company they want to cut everyone off yeah the bat. so he ended up recruiting uh somebody to take over uh his position as president and slowly sold the company to that guy but he couldn't get like a big company to just come in and buy it off him with that with those requirements how, how do you influence more women to get involved in politics or being like city mayors or stuff like that? Oh, 
don't know. You know, it's funny. Um, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when I got on the council, there's like 15 mayors on the east side and um, 12 of them were men. And there was a picture and there's just there's only two women because one wasn't in there that day. So there's there's just two women and all these guys. And now it's a majority of women. OK, so I don't think I need to encourage anybody. Okay. Nice. I didn't know that. That's actually very, very good. Um, is there anything I asked you I haven't asked you yet or anything else you want to talk about? Oh, no, I can't think of anything. I feel like I've talked too much already. No, no, that's all good stuff. <laughs> Um, so, so I asked you what your goal was in um, doing this podcast and you've asked me some pretty good questions. So are you trying to raise the social conscience? Are you trying to educate people? I'm just like, 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 you know, like try to have a good conversation, you know, put my guests in the best light and also like hopefully like people like, you know, listen to this like, oh, Bellevue might be a good place to go to, or maybe Bellevue might be a good place to start a business, you know, or Lynn Rob's an interesting person. Let me, let me go, let me go have a glass of wine with her somewhere, you know? <coughs> Went down the wrong pipe. I love the glass of wine part. So is there, is, is there a city out there, like somewhere in the United States, you're like, okay, like this city's way up here. We're down here. We want to like, that's like your goal to be like this city. So to speak, like this city has like low unemployment. Like in you, in you, like you look at, okay, this city is like where I want Bellevue to be in 20 years. We have um, comparable cities and um, <clears throat> we compare ourselves on certain parameters and some were better than, some were less than. And it was really interesting watching during COVID uh, how we did. One thing I'm super proud of is more patents are issued to Bellevue residents per capita than any other city in the country. That's a big thing. That should be like all over your website. Like... Including Cambridge. Oh, wow. Yeah. Massachusetts. That... So um, we're doing really well when we look at our comparison cities. Um the price, of, the cost of housing is still way too high. So we got to bring that down. <clears throat> um, I, you know, I just, I'm thinking of as a mayor of the parameters, but I will tell you when I first moved to Bellevue, I always wanted it to be more like Sausalito. <laughs> oh. And to me, old Bellevue is very much like Sausalito. Okay. And so I met my personal goal. Nice. Everyone for you. So I have a, so I live down in a town called DuPont, south of Tacoma, right? And I have a joke, like people in Seattle think anything south of airports in Mexico. Oh. Yeah, because no one from Seattle wants to go down there. And also I see, like, you know, I, I do a lot of network events. It's like people in Seattle don't, don't want to go to Bellevue. People in Bellevue don't go to Seattle. They don't want to cross the bridge, right? <laughs> it's like, it's only 20 minutes. Granted, probably like 40 minutes in the traffic, right? But why do you think that is? Why do you think, like, people in Seattle and Bellevue, like, kind of like, you know, in their own bubble, just want to stay there, right? And not like cross the bridge, so to speak. You like what you know. Mm. So whatever you know, you're going to be more comfortable with. And yeah. that's how people are. That's true. But I love Seattle. I lived here for 10 years. And so I go back and forth a lot. Nice. Um, think what else? Um, we talk about the homeless, you know, homeless, all the homeless stuff, everything else. Yeah. And so we met, for people don't know, um, the mayor was a guest speaker at a, at a guy I know, Mark Monroe's Tech and Wall Summit in uh, University of Washington back in July. And so I just sent her email and here she is, right? <laughs> so that's a great, that's a great event. Um, what do you remember from that event? What struck you? Um, just like all the tech people, all the startup people doing stuff, you know, I mean, Mark's a super genius guy. I've known him for a while. He's super smart. Just the energy, you know, yeah. There's a lot of energy, isn't there, in this area? Yeah, that's yeah, that is true. Like, yeah, this whole area there's a lot of energy. You know, you, where you want to call it startup energy or entrepreneur energy or what do you want to call it, right? Another thing too, I don't people realize about this area. Of course, you, you know, hear about Amazon, Microsoft, but like people don't realize like there's a big manufacturing thing here. You know, 
Um, try to seafoods out of Ballard is like a billion dollar seafood industry. <laughs> I mean, there's uh, something, I don't know what it is with some of the water, but you know, Starbucks is here, Boeing, like all these companies started here for some reason, right? And that industry is still here, you know? Yep. No, it's a, it's a very uh, great place for entrepreneurs. It's, it, but we just need to create more opportunity for people. We mm -hmm. just need to make it possible that if you have a great idea, you want to work hard, you, um, you know, you have a talent, you should be able to maximize that and you should be able to support yourself and you should be able to have stable housing. Should be able to, yeah. So um, back to affordable housing, like is affordable housing, so like, like suppose someone has a wife, husband, wife, and two kids. Is affordable, is affordable house like a three bedroom house for them or one bedroom house? Does that have any effect in it? What do you mean? Like, Suppose um, I'm making this number up. Suppose a, a, a one bedroom house, hundred thousand dollars. They can afford that. But they really need a three bedroom house. That's five hundred thousand dollars. Well, okay, we're talking made up numbers here because yeah. there is nothing for those prices. Yeah, yeah, uh, they're made I up think definitely. The harsh reality is that a family that cannot afford a, a million dollar home cannot afford a home. Yeah, and so they're hopefully. We can get them into a home ownership opportunity where they can work their way up, build equity, and and then buy something bigger. Um, we have a lot of townhouses we're putting in. Condos, because of the condo laws in Washington State, are not a, a development of choice for developers. It holds the developer too accountable for things that might happen that have nothing to do with them. It does hold them accountable for poor construction. Okay. Um, but people tend to not want to do condominiums. I say just do good condominiums. Yeah, exactly right. Do do good do, do good work. Um, Canada Bosa, uh, they're they've done a condominium in Bellevue. They're doing another one. Here's a here's a sticking point for me. So love our downtown park. That park took forty years to complete. Is that the one that's like right by the library? Or no, that, that's that Ashwood. Not? Have you never been to Bellevue Downtown Park? I think I have. It's a big circle. There's like a lot of, like a, like there's grass in the middle. There's a lot of picnic benches around it. No. That's not it. Okay, I haven't been to it then. Okay, that's your homework. Okay. You're going to go to Bellevue. You're going to park. You're going to go to Downtown Park, and then you're going to go to Maid Mauer Bay Park. Okay. It's walking distance. But, um, you know, this is a park that was initiated by the community. They wanted it way back when, and they did a public-private partnership with the city. They raised a bunch of private funds, and um, they made this park happen, and it took 40 years to complete. And, okay, I can't, I can't, I can't stop it. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Um, so your, your current term is up in 2026, right? Um, or 2025. No, what's this? 2024 now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2026. So the so the end of 2025 is the end of my term. Okay. Have you thought about what you want to do after your term of mayor is up? Like you're gonna like be a full time vacation person? You're gonna start another business, or that's too far in the future to think about? Um, all I know is whatever I do from here on out in my life, it has to be fun. Fun, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It isn't fun like our age, like everything's based around like, you know, good people having fun, like yeah. all the, you know, crack, you know, all the BS is like, I can't ever have time for that no more, right? It's like. Well, and helping people is fun for me. Yeah. So. Just want to be able to go to bed at night and feel good about my day and feel like I made a difference. So when your terms up, do you think you really be able to like, like cold turkey it, so to speak, or like just like be the mirror on one day, next day you're not, and it's like <laughs> completely like. Let loose. I mean, like I never really acclimated to the position that you perceive the mayor is. I've just done my job at a different capacity. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot of perks, um, so it's not that different than normal life. I would say the big difference as a woman is that I get heard in a way I've never been heard in my life. And that's going to be hard to lose. I will, I will, I will miss that ability. And are you expecting me like on like twenty four seven? Like, can you can you like go to like I don't know 
a grocery store on Saturday, 2 p.m. and not expect someone to say, hey, Mayor, I need some help? Uh, you know, people are really polite. They will smile at me. They might say hello. Very rarely does somebody come out and complain to me, but that has happened. Okay. And I always ask them to send me an email. Okay. Because, I mean, I'm shopping. Yeah. I'm not going to remember yeah. what they just told me. Yeah. Well, um, so anything else you want to talk about? No. Anything I did cover? Thank you, Jason. Yes. Okay. Um, Lynn, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.